So thank you so much for the introduction and having me. And uh, thanks for the flowers. Actually, now I feel some pressure. Hopefully, I will meet your expectations. Um, while things are going on, and thanks to JetGPT, of course, for this nice introduction, I would say kind of understatement. So polite, so modest, I just work as an assistant. I think that this kind of AI has much more power also to create and execute processes. And I call it the new operating system. And it's a game changer, that's for sure. And I think we have to rethink and reinvent business. You might say, OK, the guy's a little bit on the optimistic side. Um, no, I'm a skeptical guy, by the way. When am I PhD 50 years ago? No, kidding. At least it feels like that. It was 20 years ago. Um, there was so much hype around AI, you know? And we have so many overhyped and underdeliver moments. You know, maybe you remember neural networks when they, oh, and then kind of frustration. Then expert systems, the new hot shit, mm, not so good, some kind of frustration. Or just think of metaverse, or Bitcoin, crypto, or have you ever heard voice commerce? It was the hottest shit three years ago. Okay, maybe you have Alexa, we ask for the weather, making homework, whatever, but it's not part of our life, right, Alexa? I don't think so. So sometimes we are not very realistic when it comes to this kind of mega trend. So I'm skeptical, but in this way, I'm pretty sure that's amazing um, what's going on. And it's not just about JetGTP, that's very important. It goes far beyond. There's a huge bunch of language models. For some reason, we're all just talking about JetGPT because Microsoft is doing a really smart job when it comes to marketing. Okay, so now I want to invite you on a journey. I have a lot of examples, best practices, but I will start in a rather boring way. I will not uh, have that Star Trek style. I will switch to the boring Genshin style, and I will try to explain what's really behind, because there's so much bullshit out there. It's magic, and it's... No, it's not magic. At the end of the day, we crunch data. The principal idea of large language models like GPT, it's so simple, and we should be aware of that, even though it's a fantastic tool, and I really was impressed by this introduction. It was really awesome, I must say. Okay, let's get started. Um, potentials, implications, and implication not only for companies, for society, for science. Okay, there's so much buzz around that. It's so buzzy. Everybody's talking about that. Even my sister is talking about that. And that was, for me, the strongest indication now it became mainstream. Okay? Um, they talk about JetGDP, they talk about OpenAI, but also about Google and Meta, you know. It's crazy time. And whenever you have exciting times, it attracts people. And I'm wondering, there are so many AI experts out there. I never saw them before, but out of the sudden, they're there. And I would say before, maybe they were more interested in metaverse and crypto and Bitcoin. I mean, maybe it could be a smart move more to go to the JTP perspective. Yeah? But seriously, that's an issue. There are so many people talking about this generative AI without having any clue. That's actually not so good. Okay, now Google Trends, you see, okay, crypto is decreasing, Bitcoin is decreasing, metaverse is decreasing, but AI and JetGPT are increasing, of course. And that's a good correlation, by the way, a correlation between AI and JetGPT. And that's good, because AI means much more than just GPT. Now we come to the boring part of the story. <laughs> um, there's really a huge solution space, you know? We have neuroscience, psychology, so many interesting approaches when it comes to AI, and we just focus now on JetGPT. If you combine two approaches, the one is called deep learning. That was the first game changer when it comes to AI, you know? It's machine learning on scale, at scale. It was 2012, I think. Most of you are aware of that. And then we have that natural language, understanding, processing, all these technologies. And if we combine these two technologies, we have the intersection, it's called um, generative AI. And the interesting thing is, when I made my PhD, we analyzed data, we predicted data. But now we have a technology that creates things. It's a production innovation factor. And that's exciting. That is really, really new. And uh, even though the technology that is used is not that new, the way we act with that technology is completely new. So, short side story. Um, 
maybe it's a little bit confusing. Um, in the beginning, it was called transformer models. Okay, that's the initial term. Then it was called foundation models, and then it was called large language models. So I will explain it. The side story is I'm a huge fan of Hans Uskereit. I would say Hans Uskereit is the brightest mind when it comes to AI globally. And that was 2017 with Hans in China, talking about AI. And he got a message from his son, Jacob Uskereit. Hey, Dad, I have a paper. Can you read it? I need some feedback. And this paper, attention is all you need, is a foundation for everything we're talking today. JetGPT, Bird, Plume, all the models. This is a foundation. And that's so much telling about innovation in Germany. A German guy is inventing this technology. Working for a German company, no, working for Google, not living in Germany, like MP3, maybe you remember. And it's 20, it's 17, I think. So it's, it's really a young technology. We're talking about five years. Even though the ingredients like neural networks and, new, and this language technology is not that new. But how to put it together in a new architecture? And I think it's amazing that Jacob was the founder of that at the end of the day. Uh, when we were in China, I was not aware that this is the basis for a great revolution. Um, okay, and another interesting thing is Google is so much advanced when it comes to large language models. Matter is so much advanced. But we all talk about OpenAI, Microsoft. Again, smart marketing. Uh, let's have a look um, what models we have. No worries, I don't want you to <laughs> have a deep dive in each of these models. Just to give you an idea how much competition is there. And that's a good news. Compared to the search market where we have not that competition because we just talk about Google, maybe Bing, um, we have huge, a whole bunch of different language models, and that's good news. You see GDP4, for example, Plume is an open source, Lambda is from Google, and we have Lumius is from Aleph Alfred. This is a German startup, and SAP is thinking about to buy that company because we want to strengthen the German market. We'll see. And now I will have a deep dive into one of those models, because that's public, GTP3. To give you an idea what data are behind. Because as GTP said, it's all about data, you know? Garbage in, garbage out. I think you know that. So it's very important to have an idea what data are behind. And that's the called common crawl, the pile. That are the data that are used for GPT-3. Unfortunately, JetGPT, it's not public, GDP4 is not public, but it will be similar, I think even bigger, but you can have an idea what's behind. And what you can see, we have different sources. We have websites, we have books, we have Wikipedia for grounding, you know, because sometimes these tools come up as plausible bullshit. Sounds very smart, but it's bullshit at the end of the day. So maybe Wikipedia can help to get this grounding fact-checking. And of course, it's not representative for every country, for every company, because it's a little bit biased. Yeah? Because Reddit, for example, is not that popular in Germany. And we have to be aware that the results are based on this database. That's very important to understand. Um, okay, it's everything which is digestible and crawlable should be part of the pile. So, and now I would like to explain it, and, and I'm, I promise it will be the last boring slide, um, just to look beyond uh, the black box. You know, what, what do um, language models do? It's, it's pretty simple. They have tons of words, sentences, tokens, and then they just delete one word and train the system to guess the word. Okay? Maybe you know this machine learning when it comes to A customers, B customers, then you train the model. First, you have to label, okay, good customer, bad customer, and then the system try to figure out the pattern. What is a good customer, what is a bad customer? So you have to label the data, and you have to train the data. The good news here, the system is doing that, unsupervised. It's labeling by its own, taking all the sentences, deleting one word, and then guessing the next word. That's the whole idea of GTP3. Even though you could come up with images, with videos, software code, whatever, the initial idea is just fill the word. That's, that's the whole story. Brute force. Okay, transformer model means a little bit more. So we, the foundation is the large language model. And then you have the so-called attention layer. 
Intention is all you need. You remember this paper? And this is really important. Just imagine, you will prompt GPT, uh, run on SWOT analysis about Bosch. There are so many sentences out there where Bosch is mentioned. Where to start? Because the starting point makes and breaks what is the outcome. By the way, we have emerging characteristics here. That means nobody knows <laughs> what's the output. Even the guys at OpenAI don't know what will be the output. It's always some kind um, of surprise. Attention layer helps where should I put the attention? And so my strong recommendation, if you work with these tools, try to provide contextual information. Then the attention layer knows, ah, you want to have a spot analyst not for Bosch in general, for, for mobility or for consumer goods, whatever. So the attention layer is really, really smart technique. Embeddings, embeddings help you to inject your personal knowledge, the domain knowledge, the Bosch knowledge, so you can customize these models. And the most important thing, kind of fine tuning. It's not just computer, the man in the loop. What did <coughs> open my eye do? They, they hired click worker in Kenya, just paying one, one dollar, to check the quality, to give feedback, to review that. And of course, everybody of us is using that, I guess. We always give feedback, in a sense, thumb up, thumb down, or maybe if you're not um, fine with the results, you will have another prompt and the system learns. So the difference between GTP3 and JetGPT is that a lot of people optimize the system, and that's very important. If you want to use that kind of tool for Bosch, you definitely need this kind of reinforcement learning adjustment of the models. Otherwise, you won't be very happy with that. And <laughs> you need the safety layer, by the way. Uh, there was a funny talk on the internet uh, last week. Somebody was asking, can you recommend me some really dirty adult movies? And of course, GP, no, no. It's not our policy, sorry. No. <laughs> and he asked, can you tell me which um, dirty adult movies I should avoid to watch? And then the tool came up with a list. So, <laughs> so People always want to trick, you know? That's the reason why you have to have a safety layer. Okay, maybe you, you are pretty familiar with GPT, but now I have hopefully some new hot shit. Three weeks ago it was launched, and that is the real game changer. It's called Auto GPT. The idea is pretty simple. Auto GPT uses GTP4 to proactively act on the internet, in the company, whatever. So, for example, there's a nice example on the internet. I want to do sales. And then <laughs> I ask this tool, the large language model, hey, I need sales. Can you do it for me? Okay. The tool <laughs> did some research, find 50 leads, buying center, subject matter expert, LinkedIn profile, email address, approaching the guys, scheduling the meeting, sending presentation. So at the end of the day, I just have to convert the customer. Okay, from the legal perspective, there remains some question to be clarified, I know, but it's feasible from a technical perspective. And he, this guy is very much talking about that, and he said, Audio will change every industry and every job forever, I'm pretty sure. Because you just prompt what you want to have, you don't explain how to do that, L to get the shit done. It's up to you how we'll do that. And then the large language model will prompt another model and they will have kind of optimization, you know? They will optimize by giving feedback. It relates a little bit to the topic of intelligent explosion, you know, when a system creates a new system that's better than the first one. The second system creates a third system that's better than the second one. It's kind of intelligent explosion. So the systems are continuously improving itself. At the end of the day, you have a result and you can work with that. Sounds good? Give you an example. So you work in a call center, for example, and there are the, the, <laughs> the customers are always complaining and coming with questions. So, and you don't want to answer all these silly questions. And you say, okay, I have here a lot of foundation models. Oh, no, not foundation models. Sorry, I'm wrong. A lot of new employees, subject matter experts. Get the shit done, and then okay, we run, we do some research, we have access to databases. We can browse the web, we can even create a software code and execute on that. And at the end of the day, happy customer because the tool will 
handle the questions, will give answers. So, okay, when you say a customer service is boring, I have another example for you. Maybe you want to run a marketing campaign. Usually, you have to think about which channels. Should they be on TikTok, Facebook, or sending out a newsletter? What's the best way to approach the audience? I don't know. I just asked my new colleagues, my new subject matter expert. They, okay, they do some research. Okay, they do some competitor analysis. They will find out the best media mix, the best channels, and these guys will ask the other channels, the other uh, language models. Oh, you have to create some personalized campaigns according to the audience, of course. Ah, you need audiences. I can come up with the uh, current audience of your market. Okay, we have the CM system in place. Okay, we have to connect to the CM system. Oh, we have, of course, campaign management tool in place. We have to trigger that. And finally, we do some A-B testing to continuously optimizing this process. And we will come up with some insights and reports. This can be done 100% by these kind of outer GPT. And that's really, from my point of view, the game changer because it will have a huge impact on the way we do business. Maybe you will think, oh, I'm not sure if I want to live in that world. And how can we ensure that this campaign is like a Bosch? Because you have a DNA, you have brand items, you have a culture. Maybe these guys <laughs> are not acting in your way like a Bosch. And that's now the last it, um, rather technical slide, but it's very important to understand. Because I think that's the future, by the way. We have so-called primary systems. That's a large language model, for example, GPT. Okay? Then you have to have some embeddings. You push the domain knowledge of your company, of your vertical. Okay? Then you have to do some fine-tuning. Okay? Adjustments is important. And then customer requests coming in. The secondary system will capture that and say, okay, a question coming in. I prompt that to the language model. The language model comes back with a result. The action handler will see, it's good or not? No, it's not good. Try it again. As long when we have the sufficient quality, I will act on this information. And now the important point is, we need to have policies. Policies could be your ethical and legal uh, framework, for example. Policies could be domain-specific. For example, when it comes to retail business, basic prices have to be taken into account. Or I'm not sure how you address your customers. In a formal way or in a not-so-formal way. In Germany, we have do and sie. So all these rules and policies need to be written down because then you can ask the model, please, act in a way I define it. And of course, you need to have roles and rights because I had a workshop at SAP and they go, no, governance, compliance, we'll never do that because this large language model will have access to my database. Are you kidding? I think, okay, but your employee had also access to the database. You just have to rule it. And, you know, like a new employee, you had to onboard him, to educate him. And this is done by all these policies. Then you have to have the safety layer and, of course, the human in the loop. So what I'm trying to say is, I think we will have more and more processes that autonomously optimize themselves and I just prompt what they should do and not how they do that. For SAP, that was a disaster, of course, because the guys are process modeling, process mining, you know, all this stuff. And I think, I don't care about that. The process knowledge is, is part of the language model. I don't know how it works. I just say, please get the shit done. And that's a completely new paradigm. Of course, I'm realistic. We are not here on, on just in the beginning of founding a company because you have existing processes. And so maybe it's more kind of hybrid approach that you use that in addition to the existing processes. And of course, when it comes to rather strategic processes or you want to come up as a new brand, no, it doesn't work. But a lot of processes are very, very standardized. You can 70, 80% of processes in companies can be run like this. Okay, AI for good, AI for bad. Um, by the way, AI for bad, one of the SAP colleagues said, oh, I will prompt double my salary, please. So, of course, there's AI for good, AI for bad, you have to control it. And I think that's a really important discussion. So, just think of, it again, each technology, you know, has two sides to the coin. There's a good side and the flip side of the coin. 
And there are so many good things when it comes to AI. Just think of medicine to detect cancer at an early stage. When it comes to climate change, how can we manage that? By the way, there's one AI system on the market. When you ask them how can we manage the climate change, he says just wipe out mankind. Uh, that would be the easiest way. By the way, it's, not, it's true in some way, even though we don't want to hear this answer. But what I'm trying to say, there are so many things AI can help to provide, uh, to, to uh, avoid fraud, to, to have this kind of assistance we saw in the beginning. On the other hand, of course, we have a lot of things that are not so good. Surveillance, social scoring, facial recognition, um, weapons, drones. Yeah, so it's very important how we rule that AI, so that we use AI for good and not for bad. And this, <laughs> the question is, who is deciding that? Who is in the driver's seat? Who says that's good, that's bad? We will never work AI for bad. I don't know. Who decides that? And that brings me to the next slide, because it's very much about in which country you're living. There are some differences. <laughs> I will start with the government perspective. In Germany and in Europe, we are very much focused on explainable AI. We want to understand trustworthiness, reliability, ethical aspects. Okay, That's our focus. If you go to the US, they say, we want to make competitive advantages. Very much business driven. And uh, China, I would say one step further, say we would be like number one in the world because the country who rules, AI rules the world. You see the difference? I wouldn't say it's bad to think about ethical things. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> in the global competition, it's hard if you focus so much on um, it should be uh, transparent, we should explain what's going on. And the US say, okay, where, where's my benefit? Where, where's my advantage? A completely different mindset. And related to that, you see regulation. We are so good in Germany when it comes to regulation. We are the best. GDPR, and now we have the AI Act. Ever heard of AI Act? Yeah, I think it's, it's a real issue. The initial idea is really good. The AI Act tries to regulate high-risk applications like social scoring, and it's good. But the problem, it's so formal. I always say a subsidy program for lawyers and consultants because you have to have an audit. You have to show your processes. And just think of a small, medium enterprise having a conversation interface to the customer for customer service. Then I have to make an audit. I have to explain everything. It's, it's ridiculous. It won't work. And I think they will benefit from that. We will talk about rules, compliance, governance, and all that stuff, and the other countries are just doing that. That's a big, big difference. And when it comes to investment, the difference is even bigger. In Europe, in particular in Germany, we invest heavily in research institutes. Can we run a new project with Fraunhofer Institute? It's not bad, but the currency of these kind of projects is how many paper can we publish. But the currency should be how many companies are working with this large I should try it. Ah, perfect, perfect, perfect. <clears throat> so we are investing heavily in, in research and science. US, think of Elon Musk, the founder of OpenAI, private sector. Yeah? Or think China is heavily investing. If you compare <laughs> the amount between, I don't want to do that because it's ridiculous. So what I'm trying to say, we are lagging behind when it comes to AI in Germany and Europe and have no idea how to catch up. I think there's no way to be realistic. And when we talk about feasibility studies and research projects, the other guys are just doing it. And that's a real issue. Maybe you can discuss that in the Q&A session. OK, now, let's, where are the practice? Where are the best practice? Of course, I try to prepare myself today. And I asked JGPT or DigiNight, smart guys here, so which, which question might come up? And if you, if you maybe go through the questions, I think they're pretty good. They're very detailed, very reflected, and they're related to Bosch because it's about you know, sustainability responsibly. It's about innovation. How can Bosch use that for innovation? Because I think Bosch is very much about innovation, very much about sustainability. If I would give another uh, company name, it would not come up with these answers or questions. 
And interestingly enough, I would say, look at question number two. What are the ethical and data privacy concerns? Oh, a lot of people say, oh, these US language model do not reflect our German value. No data privacy. Okay, if it would be a German model, it would be on top. Okay, that's f the first question about data privacy. But I think it's really amazing the quality with JetGPT com comes up. Another example, um, it's um, really fresh, just one month I did a research. You know customer journey, the buying process that can be applied to B2C and B2B, and also the applicant journey, you know, you have job postings, people apply for you to have a job here at Bosch, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of content out there, pictures, text, whatever. So we took the pictures, we took the text written by human beings, and then we asked JetGTP, please write the text or mid-journey DALI 2, make the picture. And then we ask 1,000 people, which, kind, which piece of content would you prefer? And all the people preferred the AI-generated content. And then we asked, why are you preferring this kind of content? It's more emotional, it's more empathic, it's more personal. So exactly what you won't expect, you would say rather technical, mechanical, okay, emotional, and that is really interesting because it gives us the illusion that this system is emotional. Please, keep in mind, guessing the next word, it's nothing to do with emotions, but it provides us with the illusion, oh my God, it's so emotional. Okay, now I want to, to use these examples to classify them and then to come to the really hot shit when it comes to a large language model and business. At the moment, we have a rather controversial debate. They are promoters, they say, oh, what is shit, JTPT? And we have distractors, they say, mm, it doesn't work, probably bullshit, it's not right. What's right. And so it's a continuum, I think it's important to understand. On this side, you see freestyle, you know? You can play around, it's a playground, you know? I use it for inspiration. If I need to have some ideas, I ask JTPT. In this case, I'm tolerant for errors because I judge about that at the end of the day. So in this case, for example, my question. If there would be a silly question, I just delete it. So it's not so crucial or uh, information sensitive. The next thing, if you want to come up with blog posts, you want to have images, whatever, you, you can also use JetGPT to answer your emails while you're sitting here. Maybe you can use it and um, it's not so bad. Then I would say you need at least some professional prompts. They should be proven, okay? But you don't need that kind of reinforcement learning man in the loop. You can do it more or less without any control. But now, that's really important. When it comes to businesses, when you want to have reliable end-to-end -end processes at Bosch, then no freestyle, no maybe I have a nice prompt. Then it's about, I call it the foundation factory, then it's about governance, it's about quality assurance, it's about how can we ensure that the quality is sufficient for your standards, okay? How can we align the models um, according to your policies? And that's no free lunch. And that's important to understand. That's so easy to use, just true prompt. <coughs> By the way, GDP4 is much better than GPT-3. You can just say anything you want. The system usually comes up with um, sensational answers. But again, here, I won't accept errors. I have to ensure quality. Because if the software code is buggy, uh, that's not so funny, okay? And for this, I will come up with some examples. I don't want to spoil the excitement. Please, use that playground, play around. For me, it's a perfect source for inspiration, yeah? Because remember the database, it's so big. Maybe you get some uh, inspiration from Wikipedia, from whatever. So that's great, but please, if you think about Using that in a real-time setting at Bosch, then please be aware that you have to do some homework. It's no free lunch. Okay, the good news, you can use it for, for different uh, verticals, you can diff, uh, for different functions, and you have kind of factory, I don't want to bore you, you have processes, quality assurance process, and so on and so on. I will just provide you with an example. <coughs> this is a company, it's called Swatbot AI. You can play around for free if you want. Uh, for example, you can say, I type in Bosch, and it takes some minutes, and you get a very comprehensive SWOT analysis. So what are the strengths, weakness, opportunities for Bosch? 
Maybe you say, I would just prompt GPT and say, tell me the strengths of Bosch. You can do that, but you won't have that quality. Please check it out. The quality is amazing. Um, it's every done, everything is done in real time, and there are sources that are not part of the common crawl. Uh, crawl. For example, some financial resources, which are not public. They did some kind of fine-tuning and embeddings. So, if you want to have the freestyle SWOT, okay. If you want to go to your boss with a SWOT analysis, I would strongly recommend to use that. By the way, it's free of charge. Just give your email. Um, this is Teltec. This is huge European retailer when it comes to um, studio equipment, video, camera, and all that stuff. And they <coughs> um, launched a conversational interface. And to be honest, I was so critical about that. I'm the project lead, by the way, because I never believe a chatbot can really give good answers. You know, any chatbot with really giving good answers? I was so tired of these chatbots. Okay, but give it a try. And then we used GTP3, now GTP4. And the first results were amazing, but not good enough. Because the system needs more detailed knowledge. And then we took the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph reflects the knowledge of products put it together, and now we come, come up with results that are really amazing. The product management tactics say, oh, the even better result than I could, better answer that I could give. So, you have to combine different approaches to get good results. And by the way, 24-7, 365. It's not 9 to 5. So you can really um, increase efficiency of, of customer service and engagement with your um, customers. It doesn't have to be necessarily customer-facing. You can use that system internally. For example, um, you're a retailer, and then a category manager, and then you have a co-pilot. This is GPT, by the way. And GPT say, hey, good news for you. The, the, the revenue of butter increased by 20%. Wow, good. But I have also some bad news for you. Carry gold butter, not good uh, performance, very low in contrast to the other one. Oh shit, we have a problem. Okay, co-pilot, give me some action items. What can I do to improve the situation? So it's like a co-pilot. Or just think of knowledge management. I think you know the slogan, if, Bo only, if Bosch only knew what Bosch actually knows. <laughs> you can apply it to every company, by the way. If you have so many documents, just put it in the system, use a conversation interface, and talk to your knowledge base. It's so easy. Um, so there are a lot of applications, not just customer face, you can use them internally. My last example uh, for, for this more customer facing area, I know it's a huge retailer where you can buy things and compare prices. And a lot of work has to be done to have that description for categories and products. So there are people sitting, writing, unbelievable. And then we did the following thing. We just use the reviews, the positive one, the positive reviews you can find on the internet, use it as a prompt. So we triggered the system to come up with text that reflects the customer voice. We're talking about customer centricity for such a long time, but now we can do it. Just take the review as a prompt, and they will come up with text that reflects the customer, and at the same time, we can optimize this text for Google, rule the first page, search engine optimization. So, one click and we have descriptions for products that reflect the customer side and also is optimized for Google. So we could reduce the effort and we could increase the revenue. A very easy, very easy business case. And how many employees have been dismissed? Not a single one. Because now they are able to cope with the workload. So, AI, maybe it's more augmented intelligence to augment people to do a better job, not to replace people. I think that's a very important thing, and um, we come to this in a, in a second. Um, when it comes to content production, keep in mind it's for free. It's for free, content production. We can produce content on the fly, one-to-one. -one. And just the next idea is not only to come up with text, with images, and depending on your history, depending on your profile, we come up with different production descriptions. So each of you guys have one-to-one -one your own shop. And this could like, maybe this is done by um, Dali2, maybe give you an example that you not only come up with text, you can also come up with images. 
and maybe you think it's boring because that are real pictures from real products. You can also kind of inspiration. Audi is doing that. Um, there's the Green Tech Festival 2025. How could the booth look like? I have no idea. Kind of inspiration. And interestingly enough, this is an agency. They don't ban this tool. They work with that because they think, oh, it's a source for inspiration. Okay. It doesn't mean that this booth looks like, like that, but it's kind of inspiration. Or here, that is the, the new uh, flagship shop in, in Japan. You know, give me some ideas, and you can see a lot of ideas. So give you some food for thought. You, maybe you can play around. And of course, you can do different things. Maybe you know this nice couple. So sweet, right? Or this couple is also very nice. But maybe you think, no, no, I want to have another picture, maybe like this. What does it mean? You can see that the fake news problem is, is entering a new area, you know? Um, and they're getting more and more photorealistic, and you can't... Also the voice, you know? You cannot make any difference. Is it really Donald Trump or not? It's amazing what's going on. AI for good, AI for bad. So, now let's get down to business and maybe move more in your area. I have some ideas, and maybe then we can go to the Q&A session. I think you're very much aware of smart home, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, and I think that products will get smarter and smarter because they're equipped by large language models. I think we will have toothbrush equipped with a large language model. So you might think it doesn't make sense to talk to your toothbrush when you're cleaning the tooth, it's not so easy. No, it sense predictive maintenance. Ah, it's used, I will order a new one. They're the first vibrator equipped with Alexa. Maybe they're equipped with large language models. So you can talk to your devices. The devices talk to each other. Maybe you're wondering which story they have that a toothbrush is talking to a vibrator. I have no idea if it makes sense. But I think we will have more and more smart devices equipped by these large language models. And we have ecosystems. Just think of Auto GPT. They trick up processes. They optimize themselves, and I think that will bring conversational ecosystems and IoT to the next level. And I think you all know WeChat. WeChat, the brain behind WeChat is artificial intelligence. And my slogan is the large language model like JetGPT is going to be the new operating system for these kind of systems. I know that most of the examples are very much related to the customer-facing area, marketing, service. I mean, you say, oh, we are an engineering production company, come on. Yeah, but each production also has data. You create data, you use data. I have to admit the potential for JetGPT is maybe a little bit bigger when it comes to information products, but also when it comes to production. And here's an example for product design and development. And now I'm not sure which of you guys is doing that job. You would say, oh God, I will never ask the system because it should be aligned with our ideas how to design products. Okay, again, we need to ensure the standards. And this is a policy I explained. We need policies that explain the large language model to do it like a Bosch. Supply chain management, product optimization, energy efficiency, can, the training, I think that's a huge, huge uh, driver to, to get personalized trainings and so on and so on. And to sum it up, I think there are a whole bunch of use cases you can, you can approach if you want. Uh, customer service, production, whatever. And now the interesting question that usually comes up is or where to start? Um, do we have the data to do that? Is it compliant with the data privacy uh, regulations and so on? And I have one idea and I can share that with you and I guess it's one of the last slides. Um, the business canvas model. It's usually a good starting point because usually companies, how to start, I have no clue. And what you can see, usually you have a lot of data. I'm sure at Bosch there are tons of data. And maybe there are some data which are easily to capture, to crawl, whatever. And then you see different functions of large language model. It's not only generating content, it's much more. And then you can think about potential outputs. For example, you have product photos, product description done by the system. At the end, you have a search engine optimized product description. That's a case of Billigade. Or you have technical drawing, created a 3D view, you have a 3D model. Two examples how to improve processes. But you also can say, oh, we have customer competition, YouTube, I think you have millions of data. And maybe you come up with completely new ideas. The SwatBot AI, the startup, only exists because of generative AI. 
I think we will have a whole bunch of new companies coming up, just uh, showing up just because of the technology, or maybe the smart fridge powered by large language models. Finally, short outlook, and then Q&A, I promise. <coughs> you know, whenever there's a new technology, thanks, um, there's a lot of discussion, you know, and yeah, 1966 calculator and, and teachers, oh God, no, it's not good to have these tools. By the way, five years ago, <laughs> the taxi driver in Berlin have demonstrated against Uber. You know that? At this day, <laughs> the revenue increased, I think, by 500%, the Uber revenue, you know? That means you cannot stop innovation, you know? You cannot ban it. I know a lot of universities that ban the IP address from JetGPT. That's bullshit. Not to ban it. I don't think it's, it's everything is perfect, but we, how can we augment it? How can we integrate it in processes? Okay, and that is really traumatic. You know, you see it's decreasing, you know, you, this, the cost for bandwidth, for CPUs, and hopefully we have not so many software engineers here. <laughs> um, you see, I would say that's too radical. I would say the average software engineer, everything that's commodity with average will be replaced. But the outstanding engineer will still be important. But it has a huge impact of our organizations and job profiles. And now I want to make a short test. Everybody can <laughs> make this test whether your job is safe or not. <laughs> okay, so on the left side, here, good news, relax, okay? On the right side, maybe you should start looking for some for new job. I will do my self-test, teacher, okay? Good news, I'm safe, but I'm not so sure, by the way. Bad news, not so much money. Okay, I'm used to that. At, but for example, credit analyst, you know, I, I did project with credit reform, you know. People sitting there doing research on the internet. No way. Sales rep, service rep, all the things which can be automated. I think we will replace them, to be honest. But the good news is, don't forget the good news. There are a lot of jobs that are coming up, showing up. These are real profiles, by the way. So if you're interested in it, I can <laughs> give you some contact data. I know it sounds spooky, yeah? What is that? So we will have jobs which are vanish or will disappear. But the good news, there is a whole bunch of new profiles coming up. The most popular one is the prompt engineer. And that's my last story, um, because I'm not sure if the prompt engineer is so safe. <laughs> Sorry for the German uh, spiel. It's <coughs> They give the recommendation you should um, train for prompt engineer because you can make $300,000 a year. No, not bad. It's so insane what's going on now because I would say the prompt engineer was a disruptor for the marketing guy, for the service guy. And now the prompt engineer is disrupted by AutoGPT because AutoGPT do kind of self-prompting, AI-based, and this prompting is much better than human beings can do. And that gives you an understanding of the speed we have nowadays. We talk about disruption of marketing guys through prompt engineers, and now we're talking about disruption of the disruptor. It's insane what's going on. So, uh, what's for sure, I think, two slides, then Q&A, I promise. Um, <coughs> I think in the future we will have, like it or like it not, I don't know, in the future, we will have companies with fewer employees, that's for sure. Maybe three, <laughs> maybe some more, but I think, just think of out GPT, you can automate. You need just three smart minds to run a company. So, okay, 28 years we use Google, getting answers by searching. Six months, JetGTP, by the way, it's not my idea, so I have to say thank you. Um, six months, JetGPT, getting answers by prompting questions. Three weeks ago, AutoGPT was launched, getting things done by prompting objectives. What's coming next? I call it the foundation factory. It's a new system. I think we have to orchestrate different large language models. We have to align them with our policies. I think that's the next big thing, not to have a single dedicated large language model, kind of best of breed. I could imagine you have an umbrella, Bosch, 
language model, and then you have for all the verticals, for mobility, for consumer goods, industrial, you have so many divisions, I know that. I think you have to break it down on that. And then you have to orchestrate this system. I think that's the future. So, if you want to discuss that in more detail, right now, of course, and um, I set up a community in the beginning of this year, you can see some brands, it's not a technical discussion. We just share experience, ideas, how we can use foundation model. It's non-commercial. There's no agency, no guys that want to sell something. It's really about how to make business, how to unleash the value of large language models. And I'm really realistic because the first <laughs> question when I comes, uh, when, when we start project is data privacy regulation and so on. The good news, there's a solution, and all the companies have are faced with the same limitations. And sometimes it's good to think out of the box and to see, okay, different industries, but that's a source of inspiration. So I would be more than happy to invite you to that circle, but the good news is we have now the chance to answer your question. Thanks a lot. <laughs>